Major support for Do the Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, and Kern High School District with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do The Math. I'm Michael. And I'm Hilda. There you go. We got Hilda <laughs> back on set. And in studio, we have Christian. And Christian, if somebody needed to contact us, what would they need to do? For math homework help, call in Bakersfield, 636-4357. Everywhere else, 1-866-636-6284. Email math at currentdog.org. Dot org. We're online at dothemathonline.net and on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right. Thank you very much for that. Got a lot of stuff to read right there, isn't there? All right. So, Christian, where do you go to school and what grade are you in? Highgate Elementary, and I'm in fifth grade. All right. Now, Highgate is a brand new school. Yes. So, where were you attending before that? Um, Buena Vista. So, you were a bulldog for a while. Yeah. Uh -huh. And now you are... A husky. A husky. How do you like being a Husky? Um, it's good. You like that school? Yeah, it's really What do you nice. think is the best thing about being at a brand new school? Um, just a lot of new people to meet, new teachers. Yeah, so you got a lot of new teachers, new people to meet because it's not just people from Buena Vista going. Uh -huh. You've got kids from other schools going there as well. Yes. All right. How's fifth grade going? I'm um, good. And pretty good so far? Yeah. If you could change something about fifth grade, what would you change? Um, like, probably, would you like to do more of something or less of something or? Probably longer reading time. Longer reading time. All right. So do you have a favorite thing you like to read? Certain books or types? Um, I like to read the who was and like what was. Like right now I'm reading who was Cesar Chavez. Oh, okay. Like, right. So they kind of like a little uh, biography about uh -huh, the person. Yes. Good. So you're reading about Cesar Chavez. Uh-huh. That's somebody that has direct ties to Kern County. Yeah. All right. Well, you know what? We're going to have you go over to the board real quick. Okay. And what I'd like you to do is you can write things up there, but I'd like you and Hilda just to kind of discuss, because you're working on fractions in fifth grade right now, right? Yes. All right. So head on over to the board, and you can write down examples of you if you want, and just talk to Hilda about what you know about fractions at this point. Right now, I know how to, unlike fractions, I know how to turn them into like like fractions, so... They're like the same, they, the denominator is like not different, so you could add them up, subtract them, and like, yeah. Okay, so finding like a common denominator. Yeah, a common denominator. Okay, uh -huh. all right. Could you show an, ex an example of that? Um, so how about if I give you, let's go two over three. Okay. and then add, so we'll put an addition symbol in there. And let's say uh, three over four. Okay. And you obviously have unlike denominators, right? Yeah. So what would you do in that case? What we would do is we would Are you a little stuck? Yeah, I'm a little stuck. Perfect. I want you to leave that problem right on the board, all right? Because okay. right now it is time for today's Math in the News. All right.
Brian. Today's Math in the News has to deal with playing cards. So we're going to get to your problem in just a little bit, but okay. come on up here real quick. And uh, you know what playing cards are, right? Yeah. Okay. So if you open up a deck of cards, you have four different suits. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, what do you notice about this? What do you notice about these? They're all diamonds. Hey, they're all diamonds, right? Uh -huh. They're all one suit. Yeah. Okay. Now, when you open up a deck of cards, you know how many cards are in there? No. Okay, there are 52 cards. Okay. All right? Because each suit has 13 cards. 13 right? cards. So an ace would count as one, mm -hmm. right? And then we have two, three, and then we go all the way through to 10, mm -hmm. right? And then we have three face cards, all right? So this would be the 11th card, 12th card, 12th. 13th okay. card. Yeah. So if we do 13 times four suits, that would be 52. Yeah. All right. Now, let's say we just got want to deal with the first three here. All right. Mm -hmm. And I have them in order. Well, let's put them in order so that they make sense to you going from left to right. Right. So you've got one, two and three. Mm -hmm. Is there another way you could arrange those instead of just one, two and three by moving those around? Um, so instead of one, two, three, what else could we do? Could we do one, three, two? That would be a different order, wouldn't it? Couldn't we do just this way? We could do three, two, one. Three, two, one. Right. What else could we do? Can you think of another one? No. Could we start with two? Um, yeah. Okay, show me how you would start with two. two. You could do two, three, one. Two, right? three, what else one. could you do? Because you want to stay two at the beginning. Uh -huh. So what would you do with these two? You'd switch them. There you go. So there's another way to switch those around, right? Yeah. Okay. So Hilda's going to put up on the board a symbol. And this is the symbol for factorial. All right. What does that look like to you? An exclamation point. An exclamation point. Okay. But factorial means what you're going to do is you're going to take the number in front of the factorial symbol and uh -huh. multiply it by everything underneath it that comes before it. All right. Okay. So let's go three factorial. All right. So what that means three times two times one. So what's three times two? Three times two is six. And what's six times one? Six times one is six. Right. So three factorial would be the same as six. Okay. okay. So if we had three different cards, there are six different ways we could put those so that they would be unique. Does that make sense so far? Kind of, yeah. Okay. So we could go one, two, three. Mm -hmm. We could go one, three, two. Mm -hmm. Right? Then we could start with the two. We could go two, one, three. Or what did I start? I started with that way. <laughs> two, one, three, or two, three, one. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. Then I could start with what? Start with three. And we can go three. And two, one. Or. We could do one, three, two. When Show me the last way, because we're going to start with three. Mm-hmm. Wait. Yeah, we did three, two, one, so how could we fix it now? There you go, three, one, two. All right? So those were the six different ways we could do it, all right? Okay, yes. Now, if we had all 13, instead of doing every single combination, how do you think we could figure out how many there were? Because with three, we did three factorial. Mm-hmm. So if we have 13 cards, what do you think we would need to write? Because I have three cards, uh -huh. so I went three factorial. If I had two cards, I would do two factorial. Two factorial. Right? If I have four cards, what would it be? Four factorial. There you go. Now, if I have 13 cards, what's it going to be? 13 factorial. 13 factorial. Right? Now that means 13 times what? Times 2. Look at the order, right? So 3 oh, factorial three. was 3 times 2 times 1. Everything underneath it. So 13 factorial would be what? What's the next number under 13? Under 13, 12. Then the next one is? Um, 11, 10. So you see how that keeps going? 9. There you go. Eight, All right. Now, do you seven, think that's going to be a small number or a big number? Um, 
A small number. A small number? Let's start at the beginning. What's one times two? Let's start that end. Um, two. What's two times three? Six. Six times four? Two, four, six, 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 six. Twenty-four. Twenty-four times five? Twenty-four times five. You gonna need a calculator soon? That, see, that's when we started needing a calculator, right? 120. Ooh, nicely done. I like that mental math right there, right? 120. Now, here you go. What about 120 times 6? So, 720. Oh, you are on it. My man, you got the mental math going. All right, so we're at 720? Yes. Times 7. Times 7. <laughs> I'm just going to keep you going. Let you go until you keep going. So 720 times 7. It's a big one, isn't it? You want a hint? 2,400? Yeah, you're on the right track there. Oh. 5,040. But you see how this is going to keep getting larger and larger, yeah. isn't it? Okay. Now, when you open up a new deck of cards and you shuffle them one time, mm -hmm. do you think anybody in the world has ever done it where the cards would come out to be exactly the way you did it? No. No. Okay. Do you have any idea how many different ways there would be? For all of them? Yeah. Like if you shuffled it, no. how many times do you think it would take to do it again? Like open up a brand new pack and do it, and it would turn out exactly the same way you did yours. You think it'd take a hundred times, and somebody might be able to do it? Yeah. A hundred? You think mm. a thousand, a million? Well, how many do you think? Probably. I don't know. It's just so many. It keeps growing. <laughs> okay. Well, guess what? Even if we just did the thirteen right here, uh -huh. that would be over six billion. So can you imagine opening up six billion packs of cards and doing it? That's a lot, six so billion. Hard. If you did a pack of cards every second. Every second? Okay, every second, it would take you 190 years to do six billion of those. And that's just with the 13 cards. Just 13? Just 13 cards. It would take you 190 years to get the same combination. I can imagine for like all the cards of 52. That's what I'm saying, right? So it's going to be a lot. And that is today's Math in the News. The reason I bring that up is because we were playing some cards over the holiday break. And uh, it just come up like, yeah, I wonder how many different combinations you can come up with. And that's a pretty big number, that's isn't it? That's a lot of combinations. It? All right. You like the holidays? Yeah. yeah. It's a nice time of year, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen holiday lights? Yes. You have? Well, that's what we're going to talk about right now. Holiday Lights at Com is back. Drive through this three million light extravaganza from the comfort of your car. All brought to you by Dignity Health. Enjoy countless colorful displays with the whole family. And there we go. So you can see all of the information about Holiday Lights at Com. A beautiful and wonderful experience. Family tradition for uh, countless families in Kern County and throughout California. And people that have moved away come back to see Holiday Lights at Com. And we have some aerial footage right now, as it is a drive-through for the second year in a row. Proved to be very popular last year, and overwhelmingly, people wanted to do the drive-through one again, as opposed to the one where you would walk through the zoo at Com. Uh, both outstanding, but uh, I think with the new uh, way that they've got it laid out, a lot of people enjoyed it and took to it and wanted to do that again this year. So holiday lights at Com. If you phone in to do the math any Tuesday or Wednesday between now and next week, we do one of your math problems on TV, you automatically receive a pass for your entire family or your car load of people to go visit the holiday lights at Com. So instead of having individual tickets, you would get one pass for a vehicle, uh, not a bus, okay, but, but a vehicle, a regular size of vehicle. Uh, 
and you can treat everybody in your family to a, a nice night out and enjoy holiday lights. All right. In studio, we have Hilda. Now, Hilda, you, uh, you have been part of Do the Math for a long time. Yes. Okay. Do you remember when you first started with Do the Math? I'm going to think, I, I'm thinking it was maybe around 2003-ish, So maybe? it was pretty soon after the start. Yes. And do you remember how you heard about Do the Math? Um, actually, it was somebody from my district office who came and he had heard about it. So then he reached out and asked if I was interested in coming on the show and helping out. And I, of course, was a pretty new teacher and I was super excited to come and <laughs> Do some math, so yeah, so yeah. that's, I, it was Bob Bullenweider, I believe, so yeah. There you go, and you were with us for a, a good number of years. Yeah, I think almost 10 years, yeah. And what is your years. role now? Well, now I am a math coordinator here at the county office, so I get to help and support uh, school districts in Kern County. So you're still doing math. Yes. But instead of in a classroom, you're doing it throughout the entire county, helping different schools and teachers within Kern County. Yes, yes. I'm one of, I think there's about six of us, six math coordinators or specialists. Yeah. All we right. have a whole team. Great. Well, nice to have you back on Do the Math tonight. Yes, it feels good to be here. Mm. All right. Well, in studio also, we have Christian, a fifth grade student at Highgate who loves being a Husky now and uh, likes reading. Yeah. kind of biographies about people and things like that. Yes. But we're going to get you going on your fractions right now, okay? So we started with one, and you kind of got a little stuck on how to make those a common denominator. So I want you and Hilda right now to kind of work through that problem and solve that problem. All right? Go okay. to it. So I kind of remember one of the strategies now. You keep adding this the same denominator until you get this there's a certain number, and then this one has to be exact with the other one. Okay. So you so want to list out your three? I think it... So your multiples of three, it looks like? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. I just don't remember how many... Let's go about to... five. So let's go one more. One more okay. number. All right. And then go from four. So you said you're, you're making this list. So go ahead, you can keep going. Making the list and you're trying to find what? The same number where it like pairs with this, the, the okay. four. So 12. All right, so you made your two lists. So the 12 and this 12 match up. So I believe we would put this, the, the both denominators. You know, we count, so one, two, three. So we would times, oh, we would times this one right here by three, and times this one by four. Okay, I think you are correct, Christian. So you wanna go ahead and try that really quick? So that's three, it's nine. So then three, it's 12. And then over here, we put four, four. Then we would do this. That's eight on the top and 12 on the bottom. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of review really quick what we did. So you had two-thirds plus three-fourths, uh -huh. correct? And then you ended up making a list of multiples, starting with yeah. three. Uh -huh. And then you went six, nine, twelve, fifteen. And how were you able to get the next number each time? What were you doing? I was skip counting. Skip counting. Okay, and you were skip counting by what here? By threes. By threes, okay. And I'm just, having, I'm just asking you so that everyone knows yeah, uh -huh. what you were thinking. And then here we use the four and you skip counted by fours. By fours. Uh -huh. And then you noticed what? What did you notice here? That the 12 and this 12 are the same. So I use how many times I skip counted. Okay. So this one was three. So when you put a three on the bottom, it has to be the same on the top. Okay. And then this one was four. So we put four and four here. Okay, yeah. And so then you wrote equivalent fractions. Equivalent fractions. So this three fourths 
is equivalent to nine twelfths, uh -huh. which means it's the same value. Uh -huh, same value. Same, except we can rewrite them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you wrote two thirds as eight twelfths. Yes, yes. Okay. So now what would you do next? We would just add them up. So this is an improper fraction, so we had to simpl simplify it. So what I do is how much 12 goes into 7, that's one time. So there's one whole, and then, seven, and then there's some 5 left, so I put 5 twelfths. Okay, so you had 17 mm -hmm. twelfths, and then uh -huh. you, you were looking for how many times 12 went into 17, uh -huh, was it? Okay, and you got 1. Uh -huh. And then where do you get with that? How do you get that five really quick? On the rest of the, like the left of it, because there's, yeah, there's twelve goes into it once with these five, because there's minus a two minus seven. Okay. So when you put twelve, you, when you said twelve goes into seventeen once. Once. And then there'd be five left over. Five left over. Okay. And then when it's left over, you would write it. One like whole this. and five and five over twelve. Okay. So these are also, what do we call them, Dina? Um. Starts with an E. E. Equivalent fractions. Yeah, they're both equivalent. They're just different mm -hmm. ways to write them. 17 twelfths means the exact same thing as 1 and 5 twelfths. Yes. It's just this is improper and this is a mixed number. Uh -huh. All right. There you go. Nicely yeah. done. Nicely well, you know done. What? We're going to keep this going a little bit because I was going to go to something else, but you guys are on a nice roll right now. So what I'd like you to do is, uh, first of all, Excellent work with the vocabulary because you had numerator, denominator, equivalent fractions, improper fraction, things like that. So you're doing pretty well in fifth grade, which is where you're starting to learn all about fractions. Okay. Uh -huh. So do me a favor, get rid of the board, erase the board. Wait. Do this. Oh, wait. There you go. That was the other one. So you just hit it again. Good. All right. Nicely done. So grab your pen. We're going to do another problem kind of like this, all right? Okay. So I want you to come up with the first fraction. Okay. Okay, five over six. Now, would you like, so you are working with adding and subtracting fractions, mm -hmm. correct? Would you like to add or subtract from that? Um, subtract. Subtract. Very good. So let's go subtract. And let's do... 2 over 12. 12. So now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to explain to Hilda as much as you can what the process is to do that. And if you get stuck, Hilda's right there to help you out. Okay. All right? Go to it. So what I kind of thought is that just 2 more 6s, so 2 times 6 is 12. So I would jump, I would probably jump over to 2. So... I would have put, I would put and then this would be 10 and then this would be 12 and then you minus that from 2 over 12 and then you get 8 twelfths so what I did is where you know when you put 2 times 6 that's 12 so I was really thinking, I kind of don't like need to do this method, so I went from 2 and two over 2 and then times that, and then 10 over 12 minus 2 over 12 equals 8 twelfths. Okay, and yes. Yeah. There you go, equals 8 twelfths. Okay, so I noticed this was a little different than the last one because you didn't have to multiply yeah. this one. Uh huh, because. Go ahead. Because um, sometimes you don't, sometimes you kind of do have to multiply from both of them. Okay. And then sometimes you just have to multiply from one of them. Okay. Because the goal was to, what were you trying to get? To get e equivalent fractions. Okay. With the equal denominators. With those common denominators, uh -huh. common right? Denominators. So you got an equivalent fraction. These two are equivalent. Uh -huh. um, but now their denominators are, are the same. The same. Okay. And Christian, have you ever learned about simplifying fractions yet? Yes. So can you simplify 8 twelfths or is it simplified all the way? Um, I think, yeah, I believe it's simplified all the way. Well, check with Hilda when you guys work together on it. 
So I'm thinking, so 8 and 12, do they have any common factors? Hmm. I'm trying to think. Four. I'm going to give you a little bit of time to think. They could both get multiplied by two, like times two something, in order to get the answer. So okay. like four, two times four equals eight, and two times six equals twelve. Okay, perfect. So we could. So you go ahead and write. What was it? You said two, so it was four, and then you said six. I think you said. Yes. Wait. What? Because I said two times eight. Oh no, two times four equals eight, and then. 2 times 6 equals 12. So both of the ones that, like, to equal these numbers, like, they have like 2. They both yeah. have 2. Yes. They're the similar. So uh, if you want to think about it, the relationship between multiplication mm -hmm. and division, because they have a relationship. Uh -huh. So if I was to take 8 and divide it by 2, you would get 4. Uh -huh, I get 4. If I take 12 divided by 2, I'd you get would six. get 6. Uh -huh. And you just explained it in reverse to me. Uh -huh. Okay. But the equivalent fraction is 4, 6. So you can show that by, you can just put like division, like divide by 2 gives you 4, divide by 2 gives you 6. 4, 6. So four, if you want to write that really quick, just kind of show our audience. And then that would give you... Yeah, so I was just kind of showing your thinking using division. Oh, okay. But if you go back the way you were also thinking, you had said 4 times 2 is 8. Uh -huh. 6 times 2 is 12. Uh -huh. So you knew that 2 was a factor of both 8 yeah. and 12. Okay? So 4, 6 is mm -hmm. equivalent to 8, eight 12. Uh -huh. So I'm going to have you look at 4, 6 now. If you look at this, are there, do they have any factors um. in common? Because when I think about it, it's like 2 times 2, 4, and then 2 times 3 is 6. Ah. So it's like kind of the same 2. Yeah, I agree, Christian. So you want to try this method again where we divide by 2 and yeah. see what we end up with? Well, no. I think yeah, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. I think you're good. So now you have two thirds. Mm -hmm. So do they have a factor in common? I think we could do one times two and one times three, but all these ones are twos. Yeah. So they have one as a factor, but if yeah, we one. used one, it would take us right back to yeah. two thirds. So I think I think Mike asked if we could simplify. I think we've got it yeah. to its, you most, you simplify its simplest form. It twice as a matter form. of fact. <laughs> it's it's twice the amount yeah. of work. So yeah. for doing some great work right there, you've got yourself a meal courtesy of our friends at Grill and Burger. So congratulations on that. Hope you have an opportunity to go enjoy a meal there. Say hi to Lydia. She's a big fan of Do The Math, has been with us for many, many years. And you use some great vocabulary there. If I say the word root to you, what uh -huh. do you think of? I think like the type of road route, like a... So you're going on Route 5 or Route uh -huh. 66, something like that, right? Yeah. So that's a, a path on a road, right? A uh -huh. route. Are there any other kinds of routes? When you say that, it reminds me of like tree roots. Right, a plant, uh -huh. tree roots. Any other root you can think of? Any other types of roots? Those are very good two examples right there. Root. No. Well, you know what? Well, let's learn a little something today there, young man. Time now for today's Language of Mathematics. Well, once again, the language of mathematics. What does it mean in English? Well, we all know that. What does it mean in math? Let's take a look at the word root today in the language of mathematics. Maybe something you think of is it grows, right? You got some roots of a tree, you got some carrots and turnips and all kinds of roots going on there. There's other roots as well in English. You can even root for your favorite team. 
So in English, you often see this word root when you're talking about plants or cheering. Maybe even you might hear someone say, I have a solid foundation, right? I am rooted in the gospel. I am rooted in mathematics. How about that? Uh, but in math, we want to look at a little bit more interesting ideas, at least to me, because I'm a math guy. So the best way I can describe this to you, the root of a problem is either the solution to an equation or the simplified, simplified version of a particular expression. Sounds like a lot of mumbo jumbo, but I think you'll get the picture as soon as we take a look at a couple examples. Sometimes a root is called a radical, and there's all kinds of terms that go with that. We have the index, which is the number on the outside. The radical is the entire expression. The radicand is in the middle. The radical symbol is the one that goes over top, looks like a big check mark. None of which we need to look at all that importantly at, or in depth at this point. But we have this guy, is that root? No, that's Groot. There you go. So Groot is going to take a look at what we're doing here, right? The square root is what we're going to look at today. And it's probably the one you'll see most often. Okay. The square root of 25 is five. Not going to tell you how to do that yet, but see if you can get an idea about what's going on here. The square root of 100 is 10. The square root of 400 is 20. The square root of 10,000, maybe think about that for a minute. Based on the examples we've seen, the square root of 10,000, okay, I'll give you the answer, it's 100. How does this happen? How does this work? How do we get these numbers and what does the square root represent? Well, oh, there's adult group looking at us like, what in the world is going on here? Here we go. The square root of 225, that's what we want to find out, okay? So here's how you would write it in math. And the question is, what number multiplied by itself will equal the number given under the radical, okay? What number multiplied by itself will be 225? So let's take a look at maybe a couple of guesses. How about 10? We looked at that in the last one. 10 times 10, that's 100, not quite enough. So let's go to a bigger number. How about 20 times 20? There's 400, that's too big. So we gotta go back down again. We'll go back on another one maybe you already know. 12 times 12 is 144, again, not quite big enough. We'll go up a little bit more, 14 times 14, 196. We're still not quite there. So let's go up one more, 15 times 15. Heck, you might have it memorized, but if you don't, the answer is 225. And that's the number we're looking for when you find the square root of 225. Hmm, still look a little puzzled? Well, this will really puzzle you, but I wanna make sure I don't leave it out. The answer to a specific quadratic equation, okay? The directions might be something like this. What are the roots of a quadratic equation? This quadratic equation, x squared plus 5x plus 6, you don't have to know what it means, but I can tell you this. The exponent of the 2 on the x means there's going to be two solutions or two roots. If you know how to factor, you would take this quadratic, break it into two parts. Then you would break those into two parts and have two small equations. And when you solve those ones, one of the answers is negative 2, one of the answers is negative 3. And those are the two roots of the equations, also called solutions. So the ultimate question is, when are we going to use this? And the picture might even give it away. If you ever played Angry Birds, you know that they fly in a big hump faction, right? That's actually called a parabola. And the way you can graph that is with one of those equations we just looked at, a quadratic equation. So we use these in science. We use these in architecture. We use these even in flight, even if it's of a bird that's not very happy, right? On the angry bird there. All kinds of places we can use them, but uh, even more interestingly, I think, if you go back to the square root, you can think about uh, the area of a wall, the area of a floor, the area of a foundation, you can use the square root to do that. All that fun stuff to say, you gotta know your language of mathematics, and today's word was root. There you go, and Kristen even added a different root instead of the double O, R-O-U-T-E, with the root, the uh, path for a uh, vehicle, as you're traveling cross-country, seeing all sorts of great places. Anyway, we are celebrating our 20th season here on Do the Math this year, and we've been uh, lucky enough to team up with the Panama Buena Vista Union School District's music department over the last few years, and Kelly is nice enough to come in this afternoon. Kelly, how are you today? I'm well, thank you. So remind everybody where you work, like what grade level or kind of your role within the music department. I teach a band. I teach concert band, symphonic band, um, and jazz band at Tevis Junior High 
with junior high kids that are seventh grade and eighth grade. All right. Well, you've got Christian over there who's a fifth grade student at Highgate Elementary, and you guys take it away. Well, um, speaking about vocabulary, like root and root, mm -hmm. um, I asked Christian, I said, hey, we're going to talk about symmetry. And he said, what does that mean? So I should probably talk about symmetry just a little bit. The word is Y. And you guys know what symmetry is. If you think of, let's do a, a box, you can slice your box up and it's the same on one side or the other, right? So yeah. this is symmetrical to this side. And you can do that probably for any shape that you're aware of. There's a nice triangle, and we'll slice that down. And what I was wondering is, because I'm trying to hook music up with math, because music's full of math, um, do we have symmetry in music? Well, I think we do. Uh, there's a couple of different spots. If you thought of, well, the, the actual music that's written, it's, it's a lot of different things. But usually music will have, it'll go along, it's getting exciting. If we were looking at it linearly in a line, and it would get really exciting. And then at some point, it's like really exciting. And after that point, it's all kind of, well, downhill. It's not bad, it's just the end. And we'll just say that's the end of, the, of the, the music. But there's some part in here that's really exciting, and then it kind of tapers off and goes back down. And in music, the symmetry isn't usually like, it's not symmetrical. So here's, I'm just erasing our music there. Our music tends to be a lot like art or architecture. If you think of the Taj Mahal, um, I can't draw it, but it's this big beautiful thing with fountains and it's, it's pretty much the same on both sides. So you could say, yeah, it's symmetrical. If I cut it in half, you could see, put a mirror up to it and you'd see the same thing. Another one is the Mona Lisa. Okay, here we go, this is the Mona Lisa. And she smiles, right? Okay, and she's looking, well, she looks kind of weird now. And she's sitting there and she's looking out this way. Is she symmetrical? She's in the frame of the painting and she's a little bit off to the side. She's a little bit off to the side. And if you ever see wonderful um, paintings, usually they don't put the people right in the center. They'll make this, the scene look a little off and it looks beautiful that way. So the Taj Mahal is symmetrical. We also have another one, another building. We have a building in our world. Can I even draw this? I don't know. And it's used by the Department of Justice, and it's a pentagram because it has five corners. That one is symmetrical. You can divide that one, not by my drawing. But it's, it's the same on either side. And music and art and many buildings, sometimes our buildings aren't the same. You can't draw a line through it. It's not symmetrical. Math is actually accused of being this way. It's making us want it to be this way. And we don't know if it's really true. Some people say, oh, yes, it's all math. We have to do it this way. We don't always have this perfect one, but as human beings, we like things to be equal and right and balanced. We're always trying to strive for that. In nature, you will have, let's say, a seashell. We're gonna call that a seashell. That's not too bad. And it kind of spirals out. And this thing is not symmetrical, but it follows a ratio, a ratio. And what's that ratio? There's another thing. Well, if I had cookies, and I love cookies. And yeah. I gave Christian two cookies, and I took one cookie. I'm getting jitched because I only have one cookie to his two cookies. So I'm going to feel kind of bad, but you're going, woo, I got the two cookies. <laughs> and that's a ratio in a very simple way. If we use the Fibonacci scale, and here's where I went down the rabbit hole. This is too far for me. I should not be here. The I don't even know if I can spell this. Fibonacci sequence. 
Okay, that's way too far. Stop right there, Willie. That's too far. Well, it goes with these numbers, and I don't have any idea how they got them. But if you look at the pattern, here's a zero, here's a one. If you added these two together, what number do you get? You get a one. Oh, what if you add these two numbers together? Oh, wow, I get that one. So every time I add these two numbers, I get the next one in the sequence. And it keeps going for like ever. This number is called phi. <sighs> it's done like that. Phi. It's phi. Phi, phi, fo, fo. <laughs> and it just goes on. And what it is, it ends up being a ratio. What on earth does that have to do with music? Well, if you thought of some of the music that you like, and you think of how it goes, think of your favorite song. I don't know. Um, Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. That's very symmetrical. We did it up, then we came back down. What if we thought of ah, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony? You don't know what that one is. Do you know what that one is? Beethoven, everybody knows this one. That's the one where the orchestra starts out and it goes, bum, 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 bum. Okay? That one is actually using the numbers. It goes up to like five. And it goes up to five, let's see. Da, 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 ba, rest. Da, 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 ba, rest. So it's actually using these numbers, and I am not qualified enough to interpret the numbers as well. Where's that symmetry in our music? Well, he does it once, ba, 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 and then he does it again, ba, 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 ba. And every time he does it, he balances it out. So I did it once, like one cookie here and two cookies to you. Does he do it that way? I don't know. That's up to interpretation, I would say. But we're using that ratio. So in our music, is music balanced like that? The ratio from Fibonacci, which has been used for, Fibonacci was like the 12th century like a zillion years ago. Oh. He's not even dust anymore, it was so long ago. That scale, they loved those numbers and they would use it and they would put it in art like Mona Lisa. And they would, the Sistine Chapel, you know, with the hand, hand of God touching and Adam there and they don't quite touch. That's all within the sequence. Is that a coincidence? Or did the artist know, oh, I can't do it quite half and half, 50-50, one to one, that's me one cookie, you one cookie, woo, okay? Did they do that on purpose? He could have, he could have, but if you get the spiral, you start using this ratio, which ends up being the phi, which is 1.618. It's kind of like pi, what's that, three point? One, four? I don't know these things. Okay? Um, and it's a number that just kind of keeps going forever and ever and ever. But as it, the numbers keep going, they get closer and closer to that ratio. So that's what's doing it. Did we sit down and write a piece of music and say, I'm going to do math when I do it? Oh, no, probably not. But a lot of the music does, like Beethoven's. So there's one other piece. They use this term, the phi moment. Uh, there's a pop song by Queen and David Bowie, and it's called Under Pressure. And I'm going to sing it for you. It's the one, you've probably heard it, you hear the bass, and the bass goes, do, 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 It's great bass yeah. part. And in the middle of the song, Freddie Mercury does this bend of the note. Ah, and he bends it up. That's like the phi moment. And the first part of the song is probably the ratio to the second part using this ratio. Too much. Was it on purpose? I think we just go to it. I think we, we naturally just write things. We like the music. We know what we like. And it, but it does tend to end up with the ratio. This is a precursor to what I'm going to do in January. And I won't go that far into math because that's not where I be, need to be. What do you think, Christian? Um, that's crazy talk. Huh? A lot of stuff. That's crazy talk. Yeah. We like music because we like music, but there is a lot of math in it. 
I was going to say, you've got quite a bit of information over there, That's Kelly. That's too much. So, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> ratio, symmetry, pi, Fibonacci sequence, all sorts of things. I like, like the that. symmetry. That, we'll stick with that. And you that know what? That's something that I think is important for the students to understand right off the bat to understand more of that music. Yeah. I all think, right. Yeah. Exactly. Nicely done. Thank you very much Thank for that. You. And uh, we'll be back with more right after this. This week, Lab TV travels to the MIT Lincoln Laboratory in Lexington, Massachusetts to see how engineers and scientists make semiconductors in one of the world's cleanest environments. It's a very large facility to make very small things. We make extremely small switches and circuits that will end up in cell phones, in cameras, and in computers in five to ten years. And to make these tiny devices, they need to control everything in the lab. Airflow, temperature, vibration, and especially dust. This is called a clean room. And it's called a clean room because there are very few particles in there. So clean room suits or bunny suits, they have to wear them to protect the circuits that we're making from the people. So a little piece of dust that would come off of your body uh, is about a thousand times the size of a typical circuit. And so one of them would land on this wafer while we're making it would basically destroy that entire circuit. First, they start with very pure silicon dioxide, or sand. Melt it down to make molten silicon and add impurities to make it semiconductive. Then, they lower a thin silicon seed crystal and turn it slowly as they raise it to form one long cylindrical crystal. After it cools, it gets sliced into very thin wafers. Typically, when you start making a silicon circuit, you start by burning that wafer at very high temperatures in oxygen. And that's called oxidizing the wafer to create silicon dioxide just on the surface. After that, you put down various metal layers. And that's done by plasma depositing these layers and then patterning them, much like you might have done with photography, basically projecting light onto light-sensitive resist, making patterns, and then etching them away with chemicals and other uh, processes. And then they place thousands, even millions of circuits on each wafer. Well, ultimately, you have to tell these circuits what to do. But they basically are a large number of switches, kind of like switches you would have in your house. They turn lights and signals on and off. The circuits on silicon are all on that silicon layer. The little switches are all on that silicon layer. There's a whole bunch of wires, just like there's wires in your house, that connect all of those switches together. But these wires are so small that you can't see them. One of the things that we make with this facility, and using these same processes for semiconductors, are MEMS, microelectromechanical systems. They're tiny little things that actually move physically. One example is we have a device which just like a piece of paper can curl up and then curl down and do that really fast and a large number of times. It does that because there's mechanical force. You can imagine that it's like a spring up from its anchor point. And if you try to push it down, it'll pop back up. Then you can apply a voltage between the top part and the bottom part and it'll pull down onto the substrate. And then that can repeat over and over. And in fact, it could also be a shutter meaning opening and closing light. So if semiconductors are the brains in a system, then MEMS are the hands and the eyes. They move and they can sense things. MEMS are very reliable and use almost no energy, but it's a challenge to package all those functions onto one chip. The signals keep interfering with each other. So what we did is we found a way to channel all that energy in little troughs made of metallized silicon. So we etched little channels into the silicon and then we coat it with metal, and those crocs or channels move those signals on the wafer without letting them spill over to other circuits. It allows us to put many more in a very small area without them talking to each other. And then Jeremy and his team can keep making smaller and faster chips that do even more amazing things. I like to understand the world around me. Um, I like to understand why things behave the way they do, and uh, I like discovering. I would love to see these little things that we've helped to create really being used in products and really making a difference in people's lives. To find out more about semiconductors and MEMS devices, check out labtvonline.org. 
Uh, that thing could go on forever talking about semiconductors and circuits and chips and things like that. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. We are celebrating our 20th season on Do The Math this year, and we're also giving away passes to Holiday Lights at Com. All you have to do is phone in. We do one of your math problems. You've got yourself a pass for an entire vehicle full of folks to go out to see Holiday Lights at Com. In studio, we have Hilda, and we also have Christian, a fifth grade student from Highgate Elementary who has been working on fractions so far this year in fifth grade. So you, it seemed like you had a pretty good handle on how to add fractions with unlike denominators and then simplifying them if you need to. Yeah. So you and Hilda are going to now work together on the next step where you're going to multiply fractions and you're going to start off with whole numbers in there also. All right. So I'm going to let you and Hilda take it away and uh, get into the multiplication part. So Christian, I want us to start with something like this. 5 plus 5 plus 5 plus 5 plus 5. Is there a different way I could write this and make it into a multiplication problem? 5 times 5? Five? 5 times 5, right? Or you might see it like this. 5 times 5. So I wrote 5 5 times, right? So I'm going to actually introduce you, and I'm not sure if you've done anything with fractions and multiplication, but let's go ahead and look at that. Is that okay? Okay. So if I was to write a half plus a half plus a half plus a half, I'm going to keep going, plus a half, how else might I write this if I wanted to write it with multiplication? Um, five times one half. Okay. Five times one half. Similar, right? Uh-huh. Okay. So this is what we call repeated addition. Repeated addition. And we could also write this using multiplication. Okay? So right now what I want us to do is think about five times one half. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you really quick. If I write it this way, does it mean the same thing? Yes. Yes? Okay. So probably early on, three times four, you learned could also be written as 4 times 3, and you would still get the same answer, yeah. right? You might draw it out a little different, but it's still going to give you the same answer. Okay, so let's work with this problem right here. Is that okay? So I'm going to write that out nice and large, okay? And then I think just for the sake of introduction, I want us to work with a number line, okay? okay. So I'm going to draw this number line. Do you work with number lines sometimes? Um, yes, sometimes. Okay. Let's see if I can do that. And then I'm going to actually put some marks in the middle. So what would be between 0 and 1? Um, one half, like. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, so a half. And then this would be, oh, let's try that again. Hold on one second. Uh, Th this one. Th Erases the tip? Oh, yes, good. Okay, thank you. Let's just see if I can get a little closer to the half mark. So this would be one and a half. Do you see that? Uh huh. And then this would be two and a half. Okay. So it may not be perfectly equal, but you get yeah. the idea. They would be in the middle there. So if I was to start at zero, so I'm going to let you take the marker, take the pen, start at zero, and then I want you to jump a half five times. Mm -hmm, right there. Okay, so do you see that you jumped a half five times? Yeah. Okay, so a half times five uh -huh. would be the same as jumping a half five times okay five times. so if i was to ask you what's a half times five look um, at your number line where did you end up um two ho two holes and one over two mm -hmm. does that make sense to you yeah because there's five jumps and then there's five right here so when you do five five jumps of one half there's one two three four five 
Oh. I think you did five. Yeah. Yeah, I see five jumps. Yeah. Okay. So a half times five is equal to? Two holes and one, one over two. Okay. So I'm going to try that method again with you, and we'll just do a number line. So let's clear the board. Do you want to clear it for me? Okay, so we'll use the number line method. Is that all right? So I'm going to write one-fourth times, I'm going to say six this time. I'll make you that number line. Okay, start with zero, one, two. And this time I need to mark off fourths for you. So we'll go... Okay, doing the best I can. Um, so this would be one fourth, two fourths. Do you see that? Yeah. Three fourths. This one is equivalent to four fourths, because four over four is one, yeah? Uh -huh. And then we could move on and go one and one fourth, one and two fourths, one and three fourths. And this would be one and four fourths, which would give us two. Two holes. Two holes. So you want to go ahead and try to see if you could do that, think about it the same way we did in that last problem. So you have one-fourth, and how many times are you going to jump? So six. Six. Okay. So one-fourth times six uh -huh. is? One hole and two fourths. Exactly. One, four, uh, one hole and two fourths. Okay? So I'm going to leave this problem up and I'm going to kind of show you just another way you might think about it. Um, so this is one fourth times. And do you know how to write six as a fraction? So the fraction. And you guys have about a minute left. Okay. So one way you could do this is you could write six as a fraction. Uh -huh. And any time you have a whole number, you can write that fraction with a 1 under it. And it's still 6. Still it's six. still 6. Mm -hmm. So when you're multiplying fractions, once you kind of draw pictures, use the number line, really conceptualize it, really make sense of it, maybe use some objects, some manipulatives, we go to this strategy, which can be a little more efficient. And then all you need to do is multiply straight across. So what's 1 times 6? Six? 6. And well, it's four times one. Four. And can you rewrite that for me as a mixed number? Or tell me what it would be? It would be nine and then two, four. Okay, Christian, thank you. And it looks like that's exactly yeah. where you landed. So this is just kind of, we call this a little bit more efficient way to think about it. But I would say I want you to focus on practicing using your number lines, your, pick, uh, your drawings, and your manipulatives. And then once you're ready, we can get to those, that more efficient way, kind of like a shortcut sometimes, as uh -huh. we call it. Thank you, Christian. Okay. There you go. Nicely done. Great Thank introduction you. to multiplying fractions right there. So, Christian, I've got a couple of questions for you. Did you like learning that about the multiplying fractions? Yes. That's a pretty nice way, right? Where mm -hmm. you can take that whole number and just count by the fourths and the halves and things like that. So... Did you learn a little something today? Um, I learned how, how when she did this, it's still the same answer as how you, much times you jumped. Yeah, so it was pretty cool, right? Did you have uh -huh. some fun today? Yeah. Perfect. You know what? I'm especially pleased that you wore your Do the Math shirt today on the show. Hey, you know what? We have phone tutors available until 530. Until we meet again, continue to do the math. Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, and Kern High School District with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.